So let's, let's go back here. So the question is, really, this is where I want to go with this. Should the true believer again, born again believer, continue to live a lifestyle of sin? Why, why, did, I, why did I pick this? Because, folks, you wouldn't believe how many times I get asked the same question about can a believer lose salvation? And when I give that answer, oh, my goodness, the comments that I get, you guys don't always see them. Some of them, people make them public, but a lot of them come to me private. And I'm okay with that. So if you got a question, you want to send it to me privately and not public, I'm okay. I answer those questions. Believe me. When I tell you I answer every question, I answer every question. So if you, you ask a question, I'm going to answer it. All right. So here's the thing. Can a true born-again believer continue to live a lifestyle of sin? Some people would say, Kevin, the way you teach, that's what you say. No. No, I've never said that. Nothing that I've taught says it. Just because I say that a born-again believer can't be lost doesn't mean that I teach that he can just sin, sin, sin. I never taught that. But I am going to teach the truth where a born-again believer cannot be lost because he can't. And guess what? If you think that is unique to me, that if you teach the true grace in new birth, that they can't be lost. It's not unique to me. Paul had the exact same problem. When Paul went around teaching this, <laughs> people were giving him the exact same response. They were saying, hey, Paul, you can't be going around teaching that. Why not? Because, man, you're teaching that people can sin and still be saved. They can just go around, if, if that's true, then they can just go around sinning, sinning, sinning without any repercussions. Paul said, no, I never said that. Watch. This is Romans chapter 3. What advantage has the Jew? And why is he talking about the Jews? Because he just finished up telling the Telling the people who never heard the gospel why they're guilty before God, even though they never heard the gospel. Romans chapter 1. Telling the people also in Romans chapter 1 how a nation dies when it continues in this, this state of depravity. And in the end, what comes? A sexual revolution, a homosexual revolution, and a, a depraved mind, which is a form of insanity. What does that look like? It looks like the last couple of verses in Romans chapter 1. You can go read it for yourself. But I'll give you a brief summary. It looks like a man, a, a, a society that can't tell a difference between a man and a woman. Folks, that's a form of insanity. Okay, then in chapter 2, he begins to tell the Jew because the Jew look at those people and say, oh, oh man, you can't even be saved. And then Paul says, ah, you think you're saved just because you're a Jew. Paul says, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. The scriptures, your scriptures don't even teach that. The Jews are only saved through the sacrifice. They then turn that into a religion of works, that if I do X, Y, Z, I'll be good with God. They even, if you go read the book of Malachi, they even detested, they hated the sacrifices. But it was the only thing that was keeping God from destroying them. Folks, it's the sacrifice that God approves, not people. He approves the sacrifice. If you accept the sacrifice, then he will approve you. Don't, don't turn that around and thinking he approve you. Then he applies the sacrifice. That's ridiculous. You need a payment for sin, and you're dead. All right, so the last part of that was then the Gentiles who were just nice people, Paul had to address them. So he started addressing them because they would do what was normal because God had told it to him. Told him what? He put the law in everybody's heart. He gave us creation, the, the two candles, creation and, and the conscience. So the out and out sinner, the people who never heard the gospel, the Jew, and the religious folks. God dealt with all three of them in Romans 1, 
in Romans 2. He continues to talk about the Jews. And this is where we get into, he starts debating with them about a works-based salvation. So what advantage has the Jew, the Jew or prophet of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because this is the advantage the Jew had. God gave the Jew the oracles, meaning the, the ordinances and the, uh, and the law. So everything that came about that in the statutes, all of that came through the Jews. <clears throat> and he gave them circumcision as a outward uh, sign that there was a covenant, folks, covenant between the Jews and God. It can't be undone because God did it. For what if some, some, yeah, some of the Jews, what if some of the Jews did not believe? Listen, please. That was a lot of Jews. Most Jews, 99% of them did not believe. Do you remember how many people out of Egypt were saved? Two. You got that? How many people were there? Millions. Millions. Approximately six million Jews. And I'm not talking about the priesthood. And that's about Moses and Aaron. Forget them. God put them aside. I'm talking about the rest of them that came out of Egypt. This is how narrow salvation is, folks. Two people, Caleb and Joshua. That's it. Okay. Now, God says, will people who don't believe, will that cause God to be unfaithful, listen, to his word? God is not faithful to people. God is faithful to himself. Everything that he does is about his own glory, about showing his own attributes, about himself. Don't forget that. He's not trying to please you. He's not trying to please me. He's never been trying to please anybody but himself. To show himself faithful. Nothing an unbeliever or a believer can do to cause God not to be true to his own word. Does it cause it to be of none effect? God says no, emphatically, no. Here's the answer. Certainly not. Forget it, man. Whether you believe this or not, it doesn't even matter to God because he's going to be faithful to his own word. And he ain't worried about me. He's not worried about you. He's not, he don't care about our opinions. Why? He's God, folks. He can speak us all out of existence and speak us back into existence if you want. You don't think he's big enough to change your mind? He can, but he's not going to do that. Why? Because he's faithful to his word. Let God be true. Every man, if you fall under mankind, you are a liar. How many men? Every one of us. Okay, that God, that you being God, right, may be justified in, listen, your words. God is only concerned about being justified in his own words, not in your eyes, not in my eyes, not in the angel's eyes, not in anyone else's eyes. He only care about his own words. So if you line up with that, you're in good company. Because God is going to be faithful to you if you are aligned with his word. It may overcome when you, uh oh, a judge. So if you don't line up with this, that day is coming. And God says, because I'm faithful to my word, you can be assured that if you don't, you're going to be judged guilty. All right. Now, here it is. This is where I want to take you. When I tell you that Paul had the same problem when he preached the gospel the way it's supposed to be preached and teach the new birth, that people would go around telling, saying things about Paul. I'll say, Paul, man, you are teaching that people can just sin, sin, sin after they're being saved. Man, you can't go around saying that. That can't be right, Paul. Paul's saying, well, what else is grace? 
Grace means you don't merit it. You can't work for it. By the way, dead people don't work. Okay. Now, here's the problem. And this is what I get all the time. If then our, who? Humans. He's just talking in general terms. Humans. If humans unrighteousness, what is that? Sin. That unrighteousness is sin. So if human sins demonstrates, folks, oh my goodness, this is a huge word in the Bible. Demonstrates, it shows the only way God's righteousness, the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God can show up. How? Somebody have to be unrighteous. If he created all of us and we were all righteous, how would we then know that God himself is righteous above and beyond our righteousness? We wouldn't know it. Why not? Because we would all still be righteous. Somebody had to be unrighteous. So that demonstration of God's righteousness can be seen. You understand what's happening here? The only way God can show that he's righteous is that somebody be unrighteous. That means somebody was going to sin. That's why Adam needed the helper. God wanted to demonstrate that he was righteous. So he allowed his creatures to sin. To show that their unrighteousness can't change him. Can't change his word. That's what's happening in the world, folks. What shall we say then? Is God then unjust? Is God because God allowed this? Because God allowed sin. He didn't create sin. He simply allowed it. Why did you do that, God? So that I can show that I'm righteous. And I'm faithful to my word. You got the picture now? Okay. Then Paul says that people saying, then God, if you're doing this to prove a point, and he is, folks, if you are doing, allowing sin just so that you can show that you are righteous, then why in the world are you judging me and pouring out your wrath Upon me and sending me to hell. Why are you doing that? You're the one who's allowing this stuff. Paul says, I'm speaking as a man. Why is that? Because he knows if he asks God directly that question, God probably struck him dead. Remember what he said in Romans 9? Who are you, old man, to question me? Should the thing Form, say to him who created it, why did you make me that? So, Paul says, certainly not. Is God unjust to punish the wicked when it was him who allowed sin to come in? He could have stopped it, but he didn't. The reason why he didn't is because he wanted to demonstrate his own righteousness. Four. How then can God judge the world if he's unjust? If God is unjust, how can he then turn around and judge the world? He's not unjust. For if the truth of God increased you and I can see the truth about God's word and what he said as sin increases as sin increases, you see more mercy more endurance more forbearance more long suffering you understand what I just said one sin should send everybody to hell. But God allows you and I to sin every second of every day without killing you. 
all that shows is that God is righteous and you're not. It shows that he has more grace, more mercy, more endurance, more forbearance, more long suffering. That's what he's talking about here. This increase is you see the infinite, infinite attributes of God. What are they? They're listed in Romans 9. Endurance with sinners, long suffering or much long suffering with sinners. And what else? Forbearance. God don't strike you dead when you sin. So he says, through my lie to his glory. Why then am I still judged as a sinner? And why not say? And this is what people tell me. Why not say then, let us, us, yes, the sinner or sinners do evil that good may come. What good? The good of the truth of God that his attributes of endurance and forbearance and long suffering increases. That's the good he's talking about. As we are, listen to Paul, as we, this is Paul and Timothy and the others that was with him, slanderously reported as some even go and affirm that we say. Paul said, wait a minute, man. People are going around saying that I say this, that I teach this. Paul says their condemnation is just. So I'm in good company if people are saying that what I say is you can go sin, sin, sin and still be a believer. I never taught that. I don't teach that because the Bible don't teach it. But when you do teach true grace, this is what it sounds like. And this is exactly what people say, so I'm not surprised. All right. Let's get back to this. I want to briefly go through all these scriptures with you. Okay. Should the born-again believer continue to live a lifestyle of sin? So this is coming out of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we? Now, this we is very restricted, folks. This we is straight to believers. If you're not a true born again believer, then he's not talking about you. You are going to continue in sin if you're not. Continue in sin. That grace, that God's grace, the same thing he mentioned that we just finished in chapter three may increase. So should I just sin, sin, sin so that I can experience more grace from God? There's your answer. So you don't even have to ask me anymore. Here's the answer to that. Certainly not. But now I'm going to tell you why. So you got the answer for me direct. Here's the why. How shall we, this we is the same people right here, believers, <laughs> who died? The believer died, folks. He died. He died. What did he die to? He died to sin. So, if the believer died to sin, if you died in the physical, can you come back and participate in anything else? No. If the believer died to sin, can he go back and participate in it? No. Paul says, how? How shall we who die to it live any longer in it? The answer is, you can't. It's that simple, folks. Why not? Because you died. And it gets better. He's going to show you how you died and what happened to you. Knowing this, that, listen, 
for a true believer, it's known, knowing this, there's no secret, okay? There's no secret portion. There's no secret method. There's nothing secret about the Christian life. It's known. It's known to the believer. That our old man, old man, yes. Remember what we started off this thing talking about. What's the old man? Your old human spirit. That's your old man, not your body. When you got saved, your body's still here. But something else, the old man, what happened to him? He was crucified. Do you even understand what that is? He died, folks. Simple, right? Die. When you're crucified, you die. It's the same thing he said up here. But when did you do that? You died with him. What? You died when Christ died. God did not wait until you made a decision. Read it slowly so that you can understand what it says. It says, knowing this, that our old man, your old human spirit, was crucified with Christ. With Christ. That's over 2,000 years ago. So I inserted this one here. What is God's purpose for crucifying us with Christ. What's the purpose, God? Why did you do that? Here's the answer in the same verse. That the body of sin might be done away with. Done away with. Completely annihilated. It's done away with at the cross. Annihilated, never to reappear, even the very possibility that the body of sin can come back. So, what is God's purpose for doing away with the body of sin? What's the purpose behind that, Lord? That we, these believers, should no longer. Be slaves of sin. There you have it. God himself told you that your own man was crucified with my son on the cross. The purpose for that is that the body of sin can be annihilated. The purpose behind that is that you now, as a true believer, who is alive now, will no longer be a slave of sin. See, you didn't have a choice before. Now that you're alive, you have a choice. To produce in you righteous works by the Holy Spirit. See? You died. Now you're living, and you're not a slave of sin. See, that's what Paul's talking about. How can we who have died live therein? You can't. That's the answer. He continues. But now, we have been delivered. The we again goes back to these believers over here, same people. What happened to us? You were delivered. You were rescued. What were you rescued from? The law. You were rescued from the law. What? From the law, yes. For the sting of the of death is sin. Where does sin come from? The reason why you die, he says, is because of sin. And the strength of sin is what? The law. That's your problem. Sin and the law. Then he says, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56. Now, also contained in the law, but the law of the spirit of life. There's a law of the spirit of life. That law is where? In Jesus Christ. That's where it's at. So if you are not in Jesus Christ, then you don't have this law working inside of you. It's the same law where when you was crucified with Jesus. 
has me created. He freed you from what? The law of sin and death. Now you're free. You're free from it, folks. Who set you free? Christ did. When you were crucified 2,000 years ago, it's just now becoming applicable to you. It's being applied now that you're a believer. I didn't become a believer, a true born-again believer. I was religious before that until I was 25 years old. That's when my eyes were open. I knew the difference, folks. It was a big time change for me. So it was evident, okay? Now, what happened? I was already crucified back with, at the cross, but it didn't become evident and applicable to me until God saved me, opened my eyes, showed me I was a sinner, which caused me to repent and through that repentance, I became not no longer a slave to, to, to sin, but a slave to the Holy Spirit. Every believer does. It's the same way. So we are now free. If I'm freed from this, I'm not living in it anymore. Now, look at what he says. But now we have been delivered from the law. Delivered from the law. And I only put in 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and Romans 8, 2 to show you what the law is. Okay? Because I don't want you to, to take the law and start thinking about Ten Commandments. That is not what he's talking about. He's talking about the sting of death, which comes as the result of the law. It produces sin, and be, be, it's there because of sin. But the strength of sin is the law. The law teaches you the knowledge of your sin, that you're a sinner because you can't keep it. Then there's a spirit of life in the law of sin and death. That's what he's talking about. You've been delivered from those things. All right? Having died. How? The question is how? How did you get delivered? You died. Died, folks. This is Romans 7, 6. How did the believer get delivered from the law. You died. You died. You died. You starting to get a, a thing? What happened to the believer? He died. What happened to the believer? He died. What happened to the believer? He died. What did he die to? The law? Of sin and death. What did he die to? The body of sin. What did he die to? Sin. The Bible teaches that the believer dies. The believer dies. The believer dies. I didn't say that, folks. If he died, to sin, to the body of sin, to the law of sin and death, then what does he live to? He lives. You can no longer live there. No longer can you live there. Right? So, to what were we held by? Okay, having died to what we were held, you and I were held as sinners to the law of sin and death. That we, listen, what is he now looking for? We should serve. Now that you're alive and no longer held by the law of sin and death, you are now serving in newness the Spirit. And not the owners of the letter. That's the believer. He's serving the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is leading him. The Spirit of God is guiding him, directing him. All right. 